Let's grab out our Bibles. We're going to do what we love to do and read some scripture and not just read, not just come for information to hear a sermon, but really ask the Lord for transformation. That's what we need. What his spirit alone can do, that his word would bear fruit in our hearts and lives, a great harvest for the glory of his name. And that's not going to come because of the brilliance of my sermon. Whether it is or isn't brilliant, that's going to become as we respond to what it is that the Spirit's saying and as we plead and ask for his grace and his touch to be upon this time. So would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for the greatness of who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness and your promise to us, which is certain, which is unfailing and unyielding in its power to accomplish all that you desire to do. So we pray, Holy Spirit, would you come, breathe life upon your word this morning. May it go forth with boldness. May it accomplish all that you desire to do in our hearts. Father, we just thank you for what it is that you're doing in our lives, in our city, all over the world, whether we see it and recognize it or not. We thank you that your kingdom is amongst us. It's being established. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that you're doing. Even this morning, we pray. And each and every one of us, Lord, may we be receptive hearers, not only hearing but doing. May we be like that fertile soil that your word can go deep in and cause great harvest to come forth from. We give you permission in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Going to go to Matthew 7. If you could turn there quickly, that would be... Wonderful. And for those who have been around so far this year, you'll know that we've done a few different messages, really kind of setting up the year, sharing what we feel the Lord is stirring us in, encouraging us in, in encouraging us in. And this morning I want to launch into taking a, a different tangent, a bit of a series, a sermon series. And normally when we approach a series, we would choose a book of the Bible. Last year we spent the entire year in the book of Acts. And I'd love to get back to some more biblical teaching. But just as we begin this year, I have on my heart for us been stirred in this regard to to preach a sermon. It'll be five or six weeks, sermon series, around this theme of firm foundations. That's the title this morning. That's what's on my heart as we launch into this journey together. Firm foundations. What is it that are the foundations of our lives and what is it that perhaps need to be and should be? What what are the firm foundations that we can build upon? Matthew six and seven, of course, five, six and seven is this uh, passage recorded in Matthew that is, many would say, the greatest sermon ever preached. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is beginning his ministry. He gathers together the crowds and he begins to preach and proclaim this eloquent and impacting sermon. He goes many different places, but what I want to focus on is how he finishes and brings together this sermon. And really there's three warnings, three encouragements, three exhortations that are contained. He talks, first of all, about a tree and its fruit. There's two types of tree. One is fruitful and one is fruitless. He talks from verse 21 about this warning of not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who know me. It's not about what you do. It's about who you know. And there's a wonderful sermon there. But I want to focus this on the third of these three. And this is, in fact, his, his final parable, his final illustration, his final exhortation as he brings this sermon to a conclusion. He says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words, this great sermon that he's proclaimed to the masses, who hears these words of mine and does them, and I want us to catch that because he'll repeat this phrase. He's not just talking about people who hear. He's talking about people who hear and do. It's not just the hearing. It's not just the the being there. It's those who actually 
grab a hold, who do something. Another translation says, those who put them into action. It's not just what have you heard, but what are you doing with what it is that you've heard. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, puts them in, into action, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Founded on the rock. There's the good side. Here's the other side of the same coin. This is verse 26. Everyone who hears these words and does not do them. And remember, he's preached to people who've all heard the words. That's really what he's getting to. You've all heard these words. Now it's over to you. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to respond? So for those who've heard the words, but do not do them, he says, they will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against that house and it fell. And not only did it fall, it says, great was the fall of it. Some translations say, great was the destruction. This wasn't a, a minor structural issue. This was great destruction that came to those who built the house, or the man who built his house upon the sand. And just to finish off, he said, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for his te he was teaching them as one who had authority. They recognized his authority. There's a difference in what he's teaching. They grabbed a hold of these words. As Jesus says, it's not just about hearing, it's about doing. It's about building on the correct foundation, firm foundations. He who hears and does, who hears and puts into action. It's interesting, a few things that strike me about this. You know, it's not if storms will come. There's an inevitability to this parable that Jesus tells. It's not if, it's when the storms come. There's this reality that the houses, for a period of time, they look very similar. There's two houses that had been built, presumably using similar methods of building in a similar fashion. And yet it was when the storms came, it wasn't the strength of the building, it was the certainty of the foundation that it was built upon. What is this foundation? There's no questioning this. Jesus makes it very clear. The foundation that these houses were built upon were Jesus' words, Jesus' teaching. It was what Jesus had come to proclaim. And that alone, you see, it strikes us, or it should strike us, as being something that stands out, something that's a little uncomfortable. In our age of permissiveness, see, he, he doesn't say that the issue at question is whether you're sincere in what you... It's really sincerity that's in question. He doesn't say in the midst of this, he doesn't say, well, it's, it's really whether these things feel good to you. Do they feel right? That should be your measure. And I mean, if it feels good, if it works for you, isn't that the mantra of our modern society? Find what works for you. Just do whatever. It doesn't feel right. If it feels right, then grab a hold of it. If it doesn't, then let it go. Jesus is saying, it's, it's, it's not your feelings. It's not about your sincerity. The common denominator, the foundation, is his words and his words alone. We can either build upon him and his teaching and find a solid rock, or else we can build upon anything else, any other religion, any other philosophy, anything else that might feel good. But ultimately, we find that it's nothing but sand, and on the last day, it will spell ruin. See, the interesting thing here as well is it's, it's not just the words of Jesus that are nice and comfortable. That a foundation is only as strong as the entirety of the foundation. There's no point in launching into a building and say, well, we're going to use the bearers only, but not the joists. We might use two and a half of the pillars rather than the full complement of four or five. A partial foundation is no better than no foundation. It's all or nothing, not just the nice and comfortable bits. 
And I'd suggest this, establishing foundations is often the hardest part of the process, particularly if you're building upon rock. If you've built anything in a landscape that most of us live in, in the ACT, it's full of rock. There's rock in the soil. Rock can be a major issue. There's hard clay that in dry times is as hard as rock. When it's wet, it can be... It's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but there's a necessity to establish strong foundations. The last couple of weeks, Adam and I have been endeavouring to complete a project that's been on the list for some time, and that is, and please do notice, because we appreciate when we put effort in and you notice what we've done, but that's the installation of a, a shade sail in the courtyard of the building here. In fact, we've had our fair share of building projects over the last couple of years as we've embarked upon the building project. But we've had these large metal poles sitting around in the garage for, uh, for some time. We had a builder who at one point was lined up to come and install. We had the engineer's report ready to go to install these big. And when you see them, I mean, they were bigger before we put them in the ground. But these are 5.5 metre plus poles that had to go down a certain depth in the ground. So the builder at one stage late last year was due to come along and he said, well, I'll be there next week, and then the next week he said, well, I'll be there the next week, and then the next week. You get the picture? Anyone else had some frustrations with tradespeople and getting them to actually show up? They're always good once they're there. And then beginning of this year, he said, look, I'm sorry. It's just in the too hard basket. It's not going to happen. You'll have to figure something else out. So Adam and I said, well, we'll we'll do it ourselves. If you wonder what we often do in our spare time, because people say, well, what, what what do pastors do? What does your week look like? Every week's different, but at moments, it's out there in the courtyard, jackhammering concrete, digging through, digging holes in the ground, and it's a good way to unwind from the stresses of pastoral life. We dig holes. We dig lots of holes. So we we embarked upon this adventure to install these poles. We had the depths we needed to go down, but, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? You, You can have all of the information in the world. You can have the drawings, you can have the measurements, you can have everything that you need to do. It's very different when you're actually trying to put those instructions in to action. It's a little messy. We got augers stuck in the ground, we had to go hire some heavier machinery, we were covered in dirt and mud, we had to clear out rubble and mess and all sorts of stuff to get these holes to the required depth to be able to insert these large metal poles that I hope all of us will now enjoy all the more now that you've heard the efforts that we've gone to to install the shade sail for you. Part of the frustrating thing is that normally with that sort of a job, nobody appreciates the effort you've gone to either because it's all underground. You can't really show off your big hole in the ground once the pole is in it. But establishing foundations, it takes work. There can be digging through inches of concrete. There can be clearing rubble. There can be augers stuck in thick clay. There can be all of these challenges. It's dirty, it's messy work, and yet it is of absolute essential nature. It's absolutely necessary that we establish the foundations that will enable whatever it is that we're building, the building itself, the structure... To last. There's no good, is there, getting halfway through and saying, well, you know, we've got one in the ground. Forget about the other three. We'll just lie them on the ground. We'll leave it. We'll use half a pole. There's, there's, there's no point in trying to build something with half a foundation. That's the context. That's the picture that I want us to grab, that with his words, we have a solid foundation. If we grab a hold of them and we put them into action, And we're willing to wrestle through. Sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. Sometimes it's a little messy. Sometimes we've got to recalibrate our... We've got to to get into the midst of it. Not to redefine it, but to allow it to redefine us. So that we can end up with that solid foundation. And it's worth doing because the only other option is if we don't do that. Even a partial foundation is no foundation at all. And you build on the sand, and it's inevitable that when the wind comes, when the storms rise against us, that the building will be compromised. And indeed, great will be 
the destruction. Now, I want to put to you that picture as an application for us as we kind of set the scene for what I'm calling a few weeks looking at, and not just looking at, but hopefully getting a bit down and dirty with, to use that analogy, getting into the midst of wrestling through this concept of firm foundations. You see, we live in a culture and a society You don't need to look very far to see there's a swirl of competing noise. There's narratives, there's volatility, there's divisiveness. We could target and pinpoint all sorts of issues as evidence of that. But even this past week, we've seen a myriad of of different contentious issues. Front page discussion of religious rights and religious discriminations, and some of these issues, or in fact all of these issues, are not normally debated politely over a cup of tea. There's, there's mobs, they're banging for blood. There's this opposing opposition divisiveness that we see all around us, and we've seen that over the last few years time and time again, whether it's racial issues, whether it's human rights issues, whether it's freedom issues, morality issues, sexuality issues. Carl Truman, who I've brought to your attention before, who writes a lot in this particular space, he had this article in World Magazine that was published the end of last year. He talks about this division, this divide, this stuff that we're feeling. He says it's because of what he calls the dueling ideas of reality. He said it's no longer just polite discussions about different ideals. There's two completely different worldviews that we see around us of what is real and what is not real. That's his analysis and assessment. It's the dueling ideas of reality. In fact, I'd add to that and say it's interesting that we've taken ideas and ideals and we've made them identity. That's why we have so much of this language about if you don't agree with me, then you're dehumanizing me. You're dehumanizing what it means for me to be a human because you don't agree with my preference of sexuality or gender issues or any of these other hot hot topic issues. It's dehumanizing. And the issue is, is, as he concludes this article, you can look it up, World Magazine, Dueling Ideas of Reality is what it's called. He says, no longer do we simply disagree on tax policy. We no longer agree on what it means to be human. It's his conclusion. In other words, there's, there's far more greater, more fundamental, more foundational issues at play. Sometimes we tend to isolate these issues and say, well, it's just about this. It's just about that. It's like, no, no th- these are symptoms of a far greater problem that we see around us in society, which is this clash of worldviews. On the one hand, we have this society that heralds a dawn of a new modernity, this militant progressive secularism. On the other side of the coin, there's many, perhaps some of this, us in this room watching the crises envelop the West with the widespread abandoning of faith, this loss of purpose, the rampant, self-focused individualism, the dis- disintegration of family, the erasing of boundaries of what it means to be man or woman, and so on goes the list. There's cracks appearing where we're thinking, okay, this is the environment in which We find ourselves now. And so my challenge to us, my question of us is how do we respond? what, What is our Christian response? What is a biblical response to some of this swirling of stuff around us? I think for some it's in the too hard basket. You see the five, 5.5 metal poles in the garage. You think, you know what? It's too hard. Just do something. It's, It's in the too hard basket. I'm abdicating from any responsibility of having to do anything else. Somebody else can deal with this problem and this mess. Either it's the too hard basket or perhaps we're in the category of, well, we'll just go along with it. It's not really that bad. There's a few cracks, but we can just wallpaper over them. We'll all be okay. Just kind of hang in and we'll redecorate the room so it hides the sloping floor and see how far we can ride this journey until it all comes tumbling down. Well, here is a third view, and this is my motivation and heart behind taking us on this journey. Here's what I hope will be our mission, to really get down and dirty in some of these things we see around us, to grab a hold of the truth 
of Scripture, of what Jesus said to reevaluate, to reestablish a foundation, to look at how do we address foundational ideologies, not just picking up and being issues related people, but actually really examining the foundation. And it's my prayer that as we embark on that mission, that in the midst of the mire, we would discover or perhaps rediscover a foundation that endures and remains. That we would see that in the midst of the confusion, there is a clarity. I know for so many of us, we're thinking it's confusing. I can't see clearly anymore. But I want to say, as we come back to this, everything comes into focus. There's a crystal clear clarity. And not only so that we would see clearly, but as always, that we as believers, as people who I pray would know what it is to build our lives on the rock, that would be caught up in and propelled forth with this clarion call, that there is a foundation. Hey, we don't need to sit there and just put up with cracks. We don't need to. We can find clarity, peace, the power of his promise that outlasts and outshines any of the temporary promises that are nothing more than quicksand that the world can ever offer us. To grab a hold of and put into actions Christ's word that's held true, that stood steady through the the centuries, through millennia, through the rise and fall of civilization. That we might say to a world, perhaps even some of us in this room, exhausted from creating and curating our own story, trying to manufacture our own identity. As the world says, you just got to manufacture something within you. We come back to this place as N.T. Wright, wonderful theologian, who I'd recommend all of his writings to you. He says this, to discover the truth that makes sense of us which restores us to sense in the nonsense of our lives. Isn't that a great phrase? The story which breathes hope in a world of chaos and love into cold hearts and lives. This is our mission. That's the introduction. Are you ready? That's where we're heading. But don't worry, I'm not getting past the introduction today. I just want to set the scene. I want to leave us with these couple of thoughts as we perhaps ponder this, as we prayerfully prepare for the journey. As I said, I'm not promising that it's all comfortable and easy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. As I said, if you want to truly reestablish foundations, then you've got to be willing to put in the work. You've got to be willing not to just relegate it to the too hard basket, you got to be willing not to just say, well, we'll patch it up. And you, You've really got to be willing to reevaluate, to wrestle through, as I said, not to redefine, but to be defined by what Jesus proclaims is the unshakable foundation of our lives. See, the simple reality is this. Truth shapes our lives. It does. It's not a matter of if truth will guide. The real question is, this is what we'll get to the bottom of in coming weeks, is What truth is it that is guiding your life? I think for many of us, certainly for many in the world, this season has been a season of shaking. And part of that's a wonderful thing because it's the shaking that reveals the foundation. Perhaps many of us have been building our lives upon things and you recognize and realize that there's aspects and things as part of the foundation that is no longer as secure as we thought it would be. And see, the truth for us that I want to grab us to grab a hold of as we launch into this journey, this is what I hope will become clear to us as we navigate through. There is only one truth that lasts. It's not compromise and confusion and this introspective futility. There'll never be there any answer to the ultimate longings in the human soul. In fact, I'll never help at all. Instead, it's heralding the uncompromised truth of Christ, of who he is, of his mission, as he says in the Gospel of John, I've come to testify to truth. That's the whole reason that I am here. 
grabbing a hold and holding that high as a beacon of hope and guarding it with a passion, as Paul says to, to, to Timothy, guard the deposit of faith like your life depends upon it. So the truth is Christianity stands not as an emotive story, not as a, a well-constructive narrative, not as practical principles, although it involves those Christianity is centred on and always will be centred upon unchangeable truth, an undeniable foundation of truth that we cling to as a refuge and that we build on as our everlasting, unfailing foundation. Can we get the worship team to come back up? And I want to finish with this. We're talking about truth. We're talking about foundations. We're talking about setting our sights and navigating through what is often areas that people would not dare to tread. But I want to encourage us with this final thought as we embrace this. You know, my heart is not that we would come through a series like this with more principles. We've got some wonderful principles. Here they are. Principles are good. Nothing wrong with principles. But ultimately, truth is not just a principle, is it? Truth is a person. And my desire for us every time we gather, but particularly in the midst of this sermon series, is not that we get caught up in issues, but that ultimately we get caught up in Him. Because He is the way, and He is the truth, and He is the life. What truth are you building your life on? How firm are your foundations? finish with this, I promise. Last story. Been reading this uh, particular account over the last month or so in the little bits and pieces of time that I've had. And it's a story that's written back in a couple of years ago, 2019, Defying Jihad. Anyone come across that book? I think someone must have, because someone recommended it to my wife up the back there, and she passed it on to me. She said, hey, you'd love this book. But it's, it's an account of a young Muslim woman She grew up in Pakistan, and for her, not all of Islam is like this, but she grew up in this radical sect of Islam. In fact, they would raise up and they'd train kids for holy jihad. That was the mission, to send them to the front line to kill infidels. She rose up, she grew up in this environment, she turned 18, the moment she could, she signed up. She said, that's what I want to do. I want to honor Allah by giving up my life on the front line as a suicide bomber, as a martyr. It was the only way she could ever believe that she could find peace that she was hoping for. And as the story goes, and you can read it, it's a wonderful account, but the very week, I think it was a day or two before she was due to go off to the training camp for that particular path of uh, action, took over the direction of her life. She was in prayer one morning. And all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to her. She had this vision or a dream, which seems increasingly common in those Muslim countries where you could never openly proclaim the gospel. But it's no hindrance to him, is it? In the midst of this dream or a vision, she said she saw herself in a, a graveyard all around. There was dead tombs, dead people. It was dark. It was morbid. And she's in the midst of this place of death and despair and destruction, devastation. First of all, it was this, this light, this blinding light. It just took over. She said, I could, I could feel it. It wasn't just seeing it. It was like flowing through every part of my body. And out of this light, there stood Jesus. There stood Jesus. And he reached out his hand to her. She said, I'll never forget it. He called me daughter. He said, daughter, come and follow me. She said, who are you? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he took her by the hand and he led her out of this place of death and decay and destruction. Long story short, she becomes a Christian God's using her in incredibly mighty, powerful ways 
and has in the midst of what was an incredibly challenging and difficult journey. I want to tell us that story for this simple reason. That is who he is. That is our Jesus. He's the God who comes into the graveyard of our human endeavors, into this futile effort of creating and curating our own story, of manufacturing our own identity. And he says to us, my daughter, my son, come and follow me. I am the way and the truth and the life. So I just want you to close your eyes. As we bring our time to a close this morning, I want to just begin by saying, you know, if there's anybody here this morning, there's something about that reality that resonates just in your heart, in your life, Maybe you've never known Jesus. Maybe you did at some particular point in your life. But you know that you've wandered far from Him. And yet this morning, I want to tell you, He's reaching out His hand. He's reaching into the midst of your graveyard. And He's calling to you, come and follow me. I am the way. I'm the only way. I am the truth and I am the life. If that's you this morning and you want to respond, I just want to invite you to raise your hand. Obviously, we've got people online. You can respond in your own way. If that's you this morning, if the Lord is drawing you and calling you, there's something in you that says yes. I want to say yes to Jesus this morning. I just want to pray for you. So if that's you asking now, just raise your hand. I can see your hand. I'm just going to wait a moment. See if there's anybody else. I can see your hand. I can see your hand. On line two, if that's you, just respond. I can't see your hand. I can't see you. The Lord does. You can just respond. Grab a hold of his hand. He says, Come follow me. Come follow me. Just one moment longer. three people here have raised their hand. I, I want to ask you one more thing, and I know this takes some courage and some boldness. But there's something in us being willing to respond. I want to ask you three, and if there's others who want to join them as well, you're welcome. I want to ask you to come forward. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in a prayer this morning. that Jesus wants to move powerfully and mightily in your heart and your life. I want to invite you to come. Please welcome them as they come. You need to look up and you can just honor the Lord. And you can just stand down here. It'd be perfect. I'll pray with you in just a moment. If the others are bold enough to join us none here. I'd love you to come forward and join him if there's others. Just know this morning, I'm, I'm laboring because sometimes you just know that there is that need for us to respond. There's just the weight of his presence. It's that sovereign drawing. The Lord's moving. You don't want to harden your heart. You want to yield to him and say, yes, that is me. Responding to what it is that he's saying. For others of us this morning, I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. So I'm just hang there. The sense I have is that for some of us, and I know it's been a trying and a challenging time in many different ways, but there's been a revealing of faulty foundations. 
And even now, perhaps the Lord is just showing you and leading you aspects, areas of your life that you know you've been leaning upon, you've been resting in, other than the unchangeable foundation of who He is. And if you need to this morning, we're going to sing a final song of worship. I encourage you just to come and kneel at the front. Let's feel that sense this morning. God is calling us back to himself. There's no time to play games. The time is short. Times are urgent. There's no time to play games. Just hope things will get better and patch up the cracks. And There's faulty foundations and this morning is a morning for you to come. Rest afresh upon His grace.